And so I'm going to create a function. I'm going to call it f inverse of x. It's an inverse function I'm building here. So we take the input and we multiply it by 5. So my input is x, I multiply it by 5. And then I add 4. And then I divide by 3. So there's my inverse function. Now why is that, what is that an inverse function of? Well, f of x is the left side here. 3x minus 4 over 5. Alright, so I claim that these functions are inverses. In other words, if you did a composite function one with the other, everything's going to cancel out and give you x. Okay? Now if you think about this, how is this problem written? This is written as f of x, or I'm sorry, f of x, which equals my function, equals to 1. All right, so f of x equals to 1. Let me write that separately. To solve this problem, if I know the inverse function, I'm going to apply it to both sides. So when I apply the f inverse function to each side, on the left side, since they're inverses, these cancel, and I have solved for x. And so the solution to this equation, x would be the inverse function of 1. And, and let's go through the steps. f inverse would be 5 times 1 plus 4 over 3, and that's 9 over 3 equals to 3, just what we expected. 3 was our answer, wasn't it? All right, now suppose that we changed our output to this function. All right, so let me erase all this, all this stuff here. Suppose I change this to what? I don't know. How about negative 4? Just make it up a number. So now I could repeat the whole solution process again. I could multiply by 5, add 4, divide by 3. Or I could say, well, look, x is equal to f inverse of my output, negative 4. And so x would be, and I use this function, 5 times negative 4 plus 4 over 3. And that equals to negative 20 plus 4 over 3. Negative, uh, what, 16 thirds. Negative 16 thirds. All right. So, I bet that's the right answer, too. Okay. Well, uh, anyway, here's the moral of the story. If I had a repetitive process where outputs of a function were continually changing, and I had to solve for the input, then it would make a, a lot of sense to construct this inverse function and just use it. And that way I could just feed these numbers into it and, and I don't have to solve. Now I'm just doing arithmetic. Because that's all this was. When I plugged um, negative 4 into the inverse function, I was just doing arithmetic. So that's a, that's a way of doing something. If you had to do something on a large scale very fast, you, know, you could program a computer to do these things. All right, well, um, on, a, on a more elevated level, there are processes which use... Um, in which, you know, engineers or, or scientists use inverse functions or inverse processes to solve. Now, they may be usually a lot more complicated than the algebra like this, but uh, there are, you know, related processes where, where they use this um, inverse idea to solve things on the fly. So, anyway, just um, kind of a glimpse of that. Uh, now, one more thing about inverse functions, and... Um, is that they do have a geometric property. Also, we've talked about even and odd functions, their geometric properties. We've, we've talked about um, other kinds of terminology associated with graphs. So I'm going to leave you in this topic with, with one more. Um, let's look at um, hmm, about y equals to x squared. 
and I'm going to restrict my domain so that x is greater than or equal to zero. All right, now what does this look like? This is a half of a parabola, like this. It starts there. I restricted the domain so that x was only greater than or equal to zero because the inverse function, and I probably should have called this f of x instead of y, sorry about that. Let me call it f of x. What does the inverse function look like? Well, it kind of makes sense it would be in the square root, right? Because square root reverses the effect of squaring, and squaring reverses square roots. And um, so by restricting the domain on this function, I don't have to worry about square roots of negative numbers, which I can't graph on the xy plane. So that sort of keeps it simple. Well, um, so let me label this as y equals to x squared. And, and this function ends up being, looks like this. All right, so this says y equals to square root of x. They're inverses to one another. All right, now I'm getting to the punchline with all this. When you compare the graphs of inverse functions, you find out that they have their own symmetry. If, I, if you draw a diagonal line, and it has to be the line um, y equals to x, then you find out that one function is re it reflects across that diagonal line. In other words, these two functions are symmetric across that diagonal line. So there's one more aspect of symmetry. It's another line symmetry, except uh, it deals with this diagonal line. So that ends up, I think that's kind of interesting. So I'm going to leave it without attempting to really justify it, but you could think about justifying it in terms of how you create an inverse function. You're, you're sort of reversing the variables. But anyway, let me just write as a statement. Inverse uh, functions are, and they are symmetric, are symmetric across the diagonal y equals to x. All right, so given to you without proof, um, it's not that hard to prove, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, we have one more topic, which I think is pretty interesting. It's a uh, topic of, of iterative functions. So we'll, uh, let's move on to that.